from the health risks they face while on the job. Minister. Like Maggie Chaplin, I would actually like to put my thanks on record for the firefighters who are um, in Turkey and Syria at the moment on behalf of the Scottish Fire um, and Rescue Service. I met with the Scottish Fire Brigade's union officials along with Professor Anna Steck of the University of Central Lancaster on the 2nd of February to hear directly about their important campaign and the emerging evidence. I also have a dedicated meeting arranged with SFRS later this month to be briefed on the steps they are taking on minimising firefighter exposure to harmful contaminants and also to understand more clearly the proposals around enhanced health screening. I will carefully consider those proposals when they are received to ensure that the Scottish Government is playing its part in keeping our firefighters safe. Question number seven, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent assessment it has made of the value of outdoor education to children and young people. Minister Claire Hawking. There are a range of benefits related to outdoor education, such as connecting young people with the natural world, supporting their well-being and developing their skills for life, learning and work. In relation to recent assessments, I would point Mr Green to HMIE's thematic inspection on outdoor learning, published in February 2022, which reiterated those benefits and concluded that increasingly outdoor environments are being used to deliver the curriculum. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that? I couldn't agree more with those comments, uh, but those benefits can be reaped if the outdoor education centres are closing. Aaron Outdoor Education Centre is a wonderful facility which has been offering uh, services to the young people in North Ayrshire for considerable amounts of time. But like many outdoor education centres, it's staring down the barrel of closure due to funding cuts at local councils. Uh, can I ask, first of all, if the Minister will give serious consideration to my colleague Liz Smith's uh, proposals to enshrine access to outdoor education in law, a much needed access to outdoor education. And on the issue of Aaron, uh, would the government intervene directly on this issue? Uh, is there anything the government can do to intervene and make sure that this facility remains open uh, and free to access for many young people right across my region? Minister. So I thank Mr Green for those follow-up questions. Um, in relation to uh, Liz Smith's private uh, members' bill on residential education, the government is currently reviewing the final bill proposal. And as with any new legislative proposal, stakeholders' views must be taken into account and the full range of consequences, costs and options must be explored. And we're reviewing those perspectives, the various costs and the potential impacts before deciding on our position with the bill. With specific reference to uh, the Arran Outdoor Centre, I am aware of the potential closure as part of a range of options that have been consulted on by North Ayrshire Council. My understanding is that the Council is still in the process of finalising its budget proposals uh, and I'm also aware that the budget will not be made the council will not be making final decisions until the 1st of March as Mr Green is aware local authorities are accountable to the public that elect them and have the financial freedom to operate independently taking into account local need but I would reiterate that the Scottish government values the many forms of outdoor learning and values the specific role of residential centres question number eight Stephanie Callaghan Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress towards its 2032 affordable housing target. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Scotland has led the way in the delivery of affordable housing across the UK and I'm proud of our record of delivering 115,558 affordable homes since 2007, over 81,000 of which were for social rent. We remain committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, of which at least 70% will be uh, available for social rent and 10% will be in our remote rural and island communities. A total of 4,927 homes have now been delivered against uh, the target to the end of September 2022, of which 85% uh, are homes for social rent. Stephanie Callahan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I ask what evidence does the Scottish Government have that increased provision of affordable housing is having a positive impact on the wellbeing of Scotland's citizens, and how does this compare with other UK nations? Cabinet Secretary. Um, it's well recognised that warm, affordable homes uh, can have a positive impact on people's well-being. 
The Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, Poverty in Scotland 2021, notes that comparatively lower housing costs continue to be the principal reason for lower pro poverty rates in Scotland compared uh, with England. And keeping social rents lower than market rents, of course, benefits approximately uh, 110,000 children in poverty each year. Across the four years to 2022, we have delivered 59% more affordable homes per head of population and nine times as many social rented homes per head of population than in England and of course we re remain committed to affordable housing with £3.5 billion being made available this Parliament. Thank you. That concludes general questions and there will be a brief suspension before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, the SNP Government ordered an urgent review on how double rapist Isla Bryson, formerly Adam Graham, was allowed into a woman's prison. The review was due to be delivered to prison chiefs on Friday, but we've heard nothing further about it. The case of this double rapist has been a huge scandal, but the public are in the dark about exactly what happened and who was involved. So will the First Minister publish the urgent review in full today? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, before I turn to answer Douglas Ross's question, can I take the opportunity to express my sympathy with the people of Turkey and Syria following the devastating earthquake earlier this week? The suffering and loss of life will be felt for generations. We're committed to doing all we can to help. Members of our emergency services have already been deployed to help the search and rescue operation on the ground. Yesterday, we confirmed a £500,000 contribution to the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal. I know that all parties will help promote that appeal following First Minister's questions, and anybody who wishes and is able to do so uh, can do so at www.dec.org.uk. Second officer, turning to the question uh, on the review uh, that has been referred to, the SPS provided uh, a final report to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice on the 8th of February. Uh, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service met the Justice Secretary in the course of a regular uh, meeting schedule yesterday to discuss that. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has already confirmed uh, he will update the Criminal Justice Committee uh, this week and both the Cabinet Secretary and the SPS Chief Executive are due to attend the Justice Committee later in February where of course members of this Parliament will be able to ask questions. So there will be full 
full transparency about the findings of that review as is right and proper. Douglas Ross. Uh, could I associate myself with the remarks of the First Minister, and she's correct, all party leaders and MSPs uh, will join in solidarity after FMQs to support the DEC Scotland uh, appeal, and I welcome the uh, funding provided by the Scottish Government and I believe the significant match funding by the UK Government on all donations uh, received to help and support those who have been terribly affected uh, in Turkey uh, and Syria. So again, sorry, we're in this situation. I asked the First Minister a very direct question and I don't get an answer. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice had this report yesterday. The First Minister spoke about uh, further discussions with the Justice Committee, but failed to commit to publishing the report in full. Will she now do that? Will the First Minister confirm that her government will publish the report in full? It's on the Justice Secretary's desk. I assume she has seen it. The public deserve to see it. Because there are still so many unanswered questions. At the last count, the First Minister had refused 12 times to say if Isla Bryson is a man or a woman. And it's important because that affects how public bodies treat these criminals when they are released from jail. The First Minister says she doesn't have enough information to decide if this double rapist is a man. He's a rapist. He has a penis. What further information can the First Minister possibly need? So can I ask her, when this monster comes out of jail, Will Nicola Sturgeon, I'm sorry, if SNP members are grumbling at me calling a double rapist a monster, you should look at yourselves. Because I'm asking, when he comes out of jail, will Nicola Sturgeon and her government consider him a man or a woman? First Minister. Uh, firstly, on the uh, report, presenting officer, I, I really do think Douglas Ross is clutching at straws in his follow-up uh, question. I, I made very clear the findings, the findings of the report will be published. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirmed, I believe he confirmed in this chamber, that he will update the Criminal Justice Committee this week. Uh, Parliament rises today, uh, of course, for uh, this week, and both the Cabinet Secretary and the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, Theresa Medhurst, uh, will actually attend the Justice Committee on the 22nd of February, following uh, the week's uh, recess of Parliament, and members of that committee uh, will be able to ask questions about that review. So I'm not sure how anybody can suggest that there is not going to be full transparency around that review, but uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to set that out again uh, for Mr Ross. Um, on the uh, subsequent part of his question, uh, the individual we're talking about here uh, identifies uh, as a woman. Uh, however, it is really important, I think, to very calmly uh, set out that any rights associated uh, with that uh, are not a result of any legislation passed by this Parliament uh, and indeed wouldn't uh, be the result of that legislation even if it were in force. It's a result of the Equality Act passed uh, by the UK Parliament, reserved to the UK Parliament in 2004, uh, which is effectively and always has effectively been based on self-identification. Uh, however, uh, what it doesn't do is give any individual an automatic right uh, to be treated in a certain way in the prison estate. And actually, this case demonstrates uh, that because the individual is in a male yeah. prison. What is relevant here and why I have focused on this is the crime and the nature of the risk posed. In this case, the individual is a double rapist, and in terms of decisions about how they are dealt with in the prison estate, that is the relevant factor. Uh, and finally, presiding officer, in any group, uh, individuals, small minority of individuals, uh, will commit crimes. In no other circumstances do we accept the stigmatisation and the denial of rights to the whole group, and we shouldn't do that here either. The first, so to go back to the first point about this report, the First Minister claims I'm clutching at straws on this. It seems that she's clutching on to this report because she's not willing to issue it in full today. The report findings, we are told, will be published at some point. Why not today? Why not publish the findings and the full report that your Justice Secretary has had for over 24 hours? And for the 13th time now, 
Nicola Sturgeon has been unable to say if Isla Bryson is a man or a woman. And she says it doesn't matter because it's how they're dealt with on the prison estate. But my question was very specifically about how they're dealt with when they leave prison. And the First Minister has tied herself up in knots over this issue, unable to answer that basic question, because she can't admit the truth. Her government is going to consider this double rapist a woman. Nicola Sturgeon has brought in a policy that states everybody who claims to be a woman must be considered a woman, even if they are a dishonest sex offender with a history of violence. So Isla Bryson will be considered a woman by this government, and that's why the First Minister is refusing to answer questions about this double rapist. So let me ask her about another offender serving time right now, not a rapist, but a dangerous criminal with a history of brutal violence. Tiffany Scott, formerly known as Andrew Burns, claims to be a woman. Does the First Minister believe this criminal is a woman? First Minister. I think Douglas Ross is demonstrating here a lack of understanding in the law. Uh, any rights, any rights uh, that any individual identifying as a woman uh, have uh, flow not from any decisions of this government or any decisions of this parliament. They flow uh, from the protected characteristic provisions in the 2004 Equality Act, which is UK-wide legislation and is and has always been uh, based on self-identification. A gender recognition certificate, and of course the law passed by this parliament is not yet in force, but a gender recognition certificate uh, simply enables somebody to change their birth certificate. It does not give trans people any additional rights, um, and that is important. Uh, and in terms of how individuals are treated uh, within the prison service, uh, as I have said, that is based on the nature of the crime and the nature of the risk posed. And both of the cases, of course, that Douglas Ross has cited today demonstrate that in terms uh, of the prisons uh, that these individuals are in. Um, and in terms of uh, how prisoners are treated when they leave prison, uh, for sex offenders, of course, there are well-established uh, procedures, including the MAPA procedures. And again, they are based on an assessment of the nature of risk. So these are important issues. Uh, they are sensitive issues, not least for uh, the trans community. As I said last week and I've said before, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom only want to go on with living their lives and never commit any offences of any nature. But I don't think Douglas Ross uh, does any service to anybody in the way that he approaches this. Uh, I'm struck uh, by something his predecessor, a Scottish uh, Conservative uh, leader, Ruth Davidson, uh, has said. Trying to do gotcha questions about who is a woman, who is a man, I'm not sure helps, particularly for people in the trans community who are looking at the way this is reported. Uh, so perhaps Douglas Ross uh, could take some guidance from his predecessor uh, on uh, this matter, and that might uh, serve this whole debate better than the way he is doing yeah. right now. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you. This, this is not a, a gotcha question. It's a very basic... I'm sorry, there's dissent from the SNP. It's a very basic question. It's, it's not just me. It's journalists who are asking this repeatedly to the First Minister. And, and I wouldn't stand up here asking these questions if at any point in the 13 previous attempts I'd ever got a straight answer from Nicola Sturgeon. So maybe don't focus on the question. Focus on the deficiency of the answer. The fact that Nicola Sturgeon, now on two criminals who she said, uh, I've raised two different cases, they are. They're very different cases. But the similarity is the First Minister's point blank refusal to give an answer. And I think she has to look at that. Uh, and the First Minister accused me of basic misunderstanding uh, of legislation. I'd have to say she's guilty of either basic or deliberate uh, misunderstanding of her own policy, because it's quite clear Tiffany Scott, this dangerous criminal, is treated as a woman in a man's jail. We've spoken to a former prison officer who told us this. All officers dealing with this individual were ordered to refer to Tiffany Scott as she and threatened with disciplinary measures 
if we didn't. They said that Scott, and this is quoting them, has used gender recognition as a tool to create as much chaos as possible within the prison system. And they continued, this is a classic example of devious, dangerous individuals who are exploiting this ridiculous situation. The words of a retired prison officer who has dealt with this person. We also know that female prison officers have been ordered to carry out intimate strip searches of Tiffany Scott. Reports quote officers who say, nothing else about Scott has changed physically. And the officers say their rights have gone out of the window. So does the First Minister agree with me that this is completely unacceptable? And will she intervene today to stop women prison officers being forced to strip search the likes of Tiffany Scott? First Minister. Let me take these issues in turn. Firstly, and uh, let me reiterate this. Uh, the law that this parliament passed uh, before Christmas, backed by two thirds of MSPs uh, across this chamber, including members of Douglas Ross's uh, own party, is not yet in force. It wouldn't have the impact Douglas Ross says, even if it was in force, but it's not in force. Uh, so by definition, it can't have that impact. The policies of this government, the policies of this government on these issues uh, are guided by the Equality Act. I think I said earlier on 2004, of course, the Equality Act is 2010, but they are guided by the Equality Act, governed by the Equality Act, uh, which is a UK-wide piece of legislation. Um, and the rights uh, and protections that trans people have flow from that legislation. Um, and that is important uh, to set out. Uh, those in the prison estate uh, are dealt with depending on the nature of the crime and the nature of the risk uh, posed. Um, and again, it's important, uh, I think, for reasons of public assurance uh, to underline that as well. And that is demonstrated uh, by the two cases that have been cited in the media in recent days and here again today. Uh, and when it comes to uh, searches in the prison estate, uh, firstly, the Scottish Prison Service, uh, of course, has been dealing with transgender prisoners, although they are very, very small in number for many, many years now. They have been doing it uh, safely and effectively. Uh, they are experienced in managing uh, these situations. Uh, but of course, it's also the case that the SPS have the ability uh, to use technology uh, to search individuals without the need for any physical search uh, to be conducted by officers. The SPS uh, has a trauma-informed approach uh, to the management of those in custody um, and an approach that supports uh, staff as well as inmates uh, in their care. Uh, so the SPS is experienced uh, in these matters. I trust uh, their handling of these matters and it's important that we continue to ensure uh, that they are handled appropriately. And that's what uh, the government in association with the Scottish Prison Service will continue to do. Question number two, Anna Sarwa. President Officer, we will all be devastated by the scenes in Turkey and Syria with the uh, horrific earthquake and a death toll now sitting at. We will suspend business at this point.
we will resume. And I call at question two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, I would question disruption at any time, but to disrupt when we're talking about the lives lost in Turkey and Syria, I think is frankly disgusting. The, the death toll has now reached over 16,000, and like Douglas Ross and Nicholas Sturgeon, I send my uh, condolences to all those that have lost a loved one uh, in Turkey and Syria. And I think of all those families living in Scotland that have a connection uh, with Turkey and Syria. And can I welcome the announcements made by both the Scottish and the UK governments uh, in terms of money and resources to support uh, the relief effort? Uh, and can I also appeal to people across the country? I know times are really difficult with family budgets. But anything you can give to support the DEC appeal will make a huge difference to families suffering in uh, Turkey and Syria. <laughs> officer, this SNP government is leaving councils the length and breadth of Scotland in a dire position. Uh, despite what Nicola Sturgeon claims, independent analysis shows that the budgets councils have control over are being cut by £304 million in real terms. That means devastating consequences for vital services. So will the First Minister finally admit that she is cutting local government budgets? First Minister. Uh, this government is increasing uh, local government budgets. Uh, the resources available to local government uh, in terms of next year's budget, of course, if Parliament passes next year's budget, uh, the increase will be £570 million. Of course, inflation is sky high uh, right now. Uh, that's not uh, a result of policies of this government. And of course, that is affecting the budget of this government as well. Uh, so absolutely, it is the case that local government is struggling with these financial constraints, as all parts of the public sector, and indeed, as Anna Sarwar has just said, households uh, are struggling as well. That is why it is important that we continue to support local government as much as we can. Uh, obviously, the budgetary process is still underway and will conclude uh, following the February recess of Parliament, and we will continue to discuss with COSLA ways that we can help them mitigate the difficult situa situation they find themselves in. Of course, last week I invited Anna Sarwar to point to other parts of the draft budget that he thought we could take resources from uh, if he wants us to give more money to local government. He may have sent those to my office, I don't know, in which case uh, I will look at those, but I suspect he hasn't come up uh, with any uh, reasonable or realistic or credible proposals to do that. Anna Sarwar. First Minister knows we publish a document showing £3 billion of waste under this SNP government. That would be a good place uh, to start. But the First Minister wants to deny reality. The Fraser of Allender, the IFS, Spice, Scotland's councils, including our own, all saying there's a real terms cut to local government budgets, but a truth that this First Minister is not willing to accept. And there is no way for councils to balance the books without further destroying local services. All of Scotland's 32 councils are united in their opposition to this government's cuts. This is what a presentation to council leaders said last week. Cuts have already fallen disproportionately on council services, libraries, culture and leisure, sports facilities, youth work, waste, roads, parks. These are cuts that have already happened in previous years. And the presentation concludes that the government's plans are, and I quote, increasingly unrealistic, not sustainable, risks non-delivery of other statutory duties, and puts the financial viability of local government at risk. Councillors of every political party, including her own, are angry and warning her of the dire consequences. But Nicola Sturgeon's not listening. As usual, she is right and everyone else is wrong. Why can't the First Minister see the damage her decisions are making to our communities? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think Anna Sarwar demonstrated the lack of any credible proposals coming uh, from Labour in the first part of that question. Secondly, he mentioned uh, the IFS. Uh, it's important to underline that IFS analysis confirms uh, that council funding has increased since 2018-19. Uh, it's gone up uh, since 2013-14, it's gone up by £2.2 billion. That's 22.9% higher in cash terms. But of course, it is the case that inflation is high. So when Anna Sarwar shouts at me from a sedentary position, what about real terms? Yes, inflation is high right now, and that is affecting all parts of the public sector. And of course, that is designed down to decisions and economic mismanagement of the Conservatives at Westminster. But we come back to... We come back to the central point, presiding officer, 
All of us can accept that these are really difficult times for local councils and we will continue to work with local councils to support them as much as we can. But the draft budget that is before Parliament right now has all of the resources at our disposal, including the revenue from asking those who earn the most to pay a bit more in tax. All of uh, that revenue is allocated within that draft budget. So anybody who says, and I understand why they would make this argument that we should give more money to local government, has a duty and a responsibility to point uh, in that draft budget to the lines where they think that money should come from. Is it the NHS? Is it the police budget? Uh, these are legitimate debates. Is it social security? These are legitimate debates. Uh, but if you want to be credible in these debates, you can't only argue one side of it. You have to do both of the bits. Uh, that's what governing is all about. Anna Sarwar. We can only have an honest debate if we get an honest answer from the First Minister. This is a real terms cut to local government budgets. And the First Minister is out of touch with reality. Let's look at what's on the table. Let's look at what's on the table and the options councils are being forced to consider. Aberdeen, outsourcing all social work and children's services. Falkirk, selling off over 100 council buildings, including swimming pools and theatres. Glasgow, slashing care placements for children, which officials warn will compromise children's safety and increase the risk of abuse and neglect. Enough is enough. Get off your backs and speak out against this First Minister. Because across the country, we are facing a future where children's music lessons are cut, libraries are closed, and where bins will only be collected once a month. And the blame for all of this lies with Nicola Sturgeon and her government. Because wherever you look, this government is losing its grip. People used to say the First Minister was competent. Now she is saying, now they're saying she's out of control. And that's just people in her own political party. After 15 years of this SNP government, local government in crisis, teachers on strike, the NHS on its knees. So will she finally admit that this is an SNP budget for cuts, for closures and for strikes? First Minister. Well, no matter how much Anna Sarwar raises his voice um, in shouts, it, it doesn't cover... It doesn't cover up the fact that he has not brought forward a single proposal within a budget that is fully allocated uh, for putting a single extra penny into local government budgets. Uh, that's why he shouts, because there is absolutely zero substance in anything he's saying. All, all sound and fury and no substance is a good summary of Anas Sarwar. But let me take... Let me take some of the points. Uh, Anna Sarwar is talking about real terms. Uh, the £570 million uh, increase that I have spoken about, that is actually a real terms increase of £160.6 million, 1.3%. Secondly, in terms of uh, the proposals that councils are looking at, at this time every year, uh, councils look at a range of proposals. I've seen proposals from, I think, Glasgow City Council this morning, and the point is made. Uh, these are options that no decisions have been taken. I remember a few years ago, claims at this time of year that there were going to be 15,000 job cuts across local government. Uh, since then, uh, jobs have actually increased by 19,000. Ah. Ah. So, yes, these are difficult times for local government, but if you want to propose more money for local government within a draft budget that is fully allocated, yeah. then to have any credibility, you also have to say where that resource should come from. Um, and in the absence of Anna Sarwar uh, being clear about that, I can only assume that he wants us to take money from the National Health Service yeah. uh, or from police budgets and give it to local government uh, or social security. Perhaps it's the Scottish child payment. So if Anna Sarwar wants to be taken seriously, he really has to bring some substance to what is a very difficult difficult debate and a very difficult situation for local councils across the country. Question number three, Virgil Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact on the hospitality and tourism sectors of a ban on advertising alcohol products. First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, the consultation on alcohol advertising and promotion is 
ongoing. It's open until 9th of March. So let me be very clear, uh, no decisions have been taken on scope uh, or type of any restrictions that might be taken forward in future. The point of the consultation is to get a range of views on the most appropriate next steps in reducing alcohol-related harm, which I hope we can all recognise is one of uh, the most pressing public health challenges that we face. Uh, considering restriction in promotion of alcohol is not unique to Scotland. For example, Ireland passed legislation to bring in a number of restrictions five years ago, restrictions that were focused on reducing the exposure of children to alcohol promotion, and I think that is uh, key, reducing the exposure of children. Uh, ministers have met with a range of stakeholders, including representatives from the alcohol and advertising industries, uh, during the consultation period to hear directly from them, and of course will take seriously and consider properly all representations made. Myrtle Fraser. Can, can I thank the First Minister for her response? Mm. She will know that the whisky tourism sector is worth some £84 million annually to the Scottish economy and supports jobs in rural and remote communities where there are a few other opportunities. And yet uh, this sector, as its leaders have, have been uh, very clear about, is concerned at the threat from a ban on all alcohol advertising. Now, I would agree with the First Minister, we do need to look at sensible measures to tackle alcohol abuse. But does she agree with me that it would be absurd mm -hmm. if whisky distilleries which are so important to our economy, had to cover up all their signage, close their shops, stop promoting tours, and the likes of the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh, which is a tremendous tourism draw, had to rebrand itself and board up its windows, which is what people are concerned about. First Minister. Uh, yes. Yes, to be clear, Presiding Officer, I, I do agree with that, and I'll come back to that perhaps uh, in a moment. But firstly, the whisky tourism sector is extremely important uh, to Scotland's reputation as well as uh, to Scotland's economy. The Johnny Walker Experience uh, Centre here in Edinburgh is a prime example of that. So some of the suggestions we've heard in recent weeks, just let me uh, be clear uh, that the target would be painted signs on distilleries or visitor centres are not in our current thinking. Uh, and let me be very clear about that. There is also a world of difference. And uh, remember what I said uh, in my initial answer uh, about exposure of children to alcohol advertising. There is a world of difference between a billboard outside or in the vicinity of a school and, for example, a Johnny Walker baseball cap. Uh, so we've got to uh, look pragmatically and seriously at this. I'm glad Murdo Fraser recognised that we have a, an issue, a problem, a public health issue with alcohol misuse. So like countries such as Ireland have done, we need to look at promotion and advertising and how we sensibly restrict that to try to deal with that problem. But we need to do that uh, properly and pragmatically. And I hope uh, this answer uh, will give some reassurance uh, to those in the whisky tourism sector about some of the uh, supposed things uh, that we've heard in recent days and weeks. Natalie Dawn. As there is still a live consultation on the restriction of alcohol advertising and as no final proposals have been lodged, would the First Minister agree with me that any potential harm is still hy hypothetical at this stage, whereas the real harms being experienced by hospitality and tourism sectors caused by Brexit are being felt right now and the Tories should be pushing their Westminster leaders to address this? First Minister. I think Natalie Dawn is, is so right uh, to talk. Well, the Conservatives don't like it. To talk about the difference between hypothetical harm, um, and I understand the concerns that have been expressed, and hopefully what I've said today will allay those concerns on the part uh, of the, the whisky tourism sector, for example. But there is very real harm being done today right now uh, by Brexit. The loss of free movement is causing harm, for example, uh, specifically to our hospitality and tourism sectors as well as to the wider economy. So we'll continue to listen uh, to the hospitality sector, the tourism sector, to the, the whisky tourism sector in particular in relation to this issue uh, and take on board uh, reasonable points that they make. If only the UK government would adopt yeah. uh, a similar posture yeah. when it came to these industries expressing concern about the very real impacts and the very real harm that Brexit is doing to them right now. Craig Coy. 
Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating East Lothian publican Patrick Kearney, who has recently stepped in to prevent two local pubs, the Preston Grange Gothenburg and Preston Pans, and the Tower in the Trinent from permanent closure? But does she also recognise that around Scotland, hundreds of pubs are likely to close their do doors for good uh, this winter? So to prevent last orders being called across Scotland's hospitality sector, will she remove pubs and restaurants and cafes from the chaotic DRS scheme, replicate the UK Government's 75% rates relief for hospitality businesses? and halt the alcohol and advertising and sponsorship review, which will inevitably put further pressure on Scotland's hard-pressed publicans. First Minister. Well, firstly, let me uh, echo the congratulations extended uh, by the member in his uh, question. Of course, pubs, like many uh, businesses, are struggling uh, with high inflation right now, uh, high energy costs in particular. Yes, we'll come on yeah. to a question shortly about DRS, uh, so I'll save uh, my uh, substantial comments on that until that uh, question. Of course, uh, businesses uh, such as these will also benefit from this government's approach uh, to business rates. We have the most competitive business rates uh, regime, uh, including release uh, for businesses uh, to business rates of, of any country in the UK. So we'll continue to do everything we can to support businesses in these very difficult times. Uh, and of course, much of these difficult times are down to the economic mismanagement of the Conservative government at Westminster. Question number four, Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that 600, 600 drinks producers are concerned about the impact on their businesses and the survival of them in relation to the deposit return scheme. First Minister. But we will continue to listen to and, where possible, address concerns that have been raised. Um, in direct response to industry feedback, of course, the Scottish Government has already worked with Circularity Scotland, uh, the scheme administrator, to reduce costs to producers. This includes a reduction in producer fees of up to 40% and a two-thirds reduction in day one payments for producers using UK-wide barcodes. Uh, we continue to work with industry to ensure that there are pragmatic approaches uh, to implementation, uh, and we will do so right up to the point of implementation. Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, many of these 600 businesses are in a state of fear and even despair. Some will close, some will fail, and others will no longer sell their own produce in their own country of Scotland. First Minister, unless halted now, this scheme, which most businesses believe to be fatally flawed, will damage the reputation of Scotland as a place to do business. Therefore, First Minister, will you instruct a pause of this disaster of a scheme before it becomes a catastrophe? And will you order a thorough and independent review of how better to achieve its aims and exclude glass from the scope as the top six nations in the world on glass recycling have done. First Minister. We will continue to listen to and engage with businesses. The steps we've already taken, as I uh, set out already, demonstrate uh, that, and I think it is important to say that. Um, in fact, uh, Scotland Food and Drink recognised this approach when they said uh, in recent weeks, these changes mean that some of our key respects have been accommodated, which is positive, and means our collective effort has materially improved the implications for many businesses. In terms of uh, glass, uh, there are 44 countries and territories operating deposit return schemes. Uh, only four of them uh, don't include uh, glass. Um, and of course, it is the case that uh, there are strong environmental reasons uh, for including uh, glass. But of course, uh, on all these issues, we will continue to listen. Uh, one of the issues I, I am particularly concerned to consider further, if there is yet more we can do to reduce any impact on small producers, because uh, I think some of the concerns that are being raised there um, are not unreasonable. So we will continue to take a responsible approach, listening uh, to the concerns of business and responding uh, responsibly in the face of them. Morris Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, drinks producers have until the end of this month to sign up for the deposit return scheme. 
Those who do will be financially liable for any delays, having to fork out up to £1.5 million per month. Making matters worse, they are being asked to sign up with key information still missing. But if they don't sign up, they can't sell their products. One leading Scottish brewer described it as, and I quote, extortion tactics. Yep. Does the fin First Minister agree the deadline for such registration should be extended until the full operational, commercial and finan financial implications of the scheme are provided? First Minister. I'm struck by the fact that when we uh, did announce an extension to uh, the go live uh, date for this scheme uh, back in, I think, December 2021, giving industry additional time to prepare, I think that was criticised at the time by the, the Conservatives, amongst others, in this uh, chamber. Uh, the regulations require producers to register ahead of the launch. Registration is now open, uh, but we continue to work, and this is important, with Circularity Scotland and with businesses as they finalise uh, their operational delivery plans. This is an industry-led scheme, and the industry needs to work with the scheme administrator on a joined-up approach to delivering it. We have already made changes, I've set these out, uh, and we will continue to engage with businesses on any further uh, changes that can sensibly be made to take account of some of the issues they are raising. Question number five, Mercedes Vialba. To ask the First Minister, in light of reports of people being forced onto prepayment metres, what steps the Scottish Government is taking to support vulnerable people in Scotland with rising energy costs? First Minister. Well, first of all, uh, the Scottish Government opposes the forced installation of prepayment metres uh, because it's only uh, more likely to increase debt or leave people unable to heat their homes. Uh, we continue to call on the UK Government to provide the necessary additional support for those struggling with energy bills, but also doing everything we can uh, with the powers available to us. This includes doubling the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million and providing an additional £1.2 million to help advice services meet the increasing demand that they are dealing with. Uh, I chaired two energy summits uh, last year. As a result of these, uh, we continue to work with partners to see what more we can do uh, by working together uh, to support and protect Scottish consumers in these times. Mercedes Vialba. Oil and gas giants BP and Shell are reporting record profits on the sale of energy while millions are struggling to heat their homes. But the extortion doesn't stop there. I've received reports from Dundee Pensioners Forum that their elderly members are receiving alarming letters demanding payment from their energy suppliers. Payments to accounts that are not only not in arrears, but are actually in significant credit. And when these vulnerable people are unable to pay, to pay what they do not even owe, they're being threatened with forced prepayment installation. So, presiding officer, while I appreciate that much of energy policy is reserved, the First Minister does meet regularly with the energy providers and she does have their ear. So, will the First Minister condemn any use of such bullying and strong arm tactics? And will she commit to ending the granting of warrants by courts in Scotland for the forced installation of prepayment meetings? First Minister. I, I've, not, I've not seen the, the letters that the member refers to, uh, but of course I would condemn uh, any behaviour that seeks to, to bully uh, consumers or individuals in any way. Uh, two issues were raised in the course of that question, both important issues. Uh, firstly, taxation of oil and gas companies, um, and secondly, energy regulation. Both of these things are reserved to the UK government. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we had powers uh, here in the Scottish Parliament, and perhaps the member will support our calls for such powers in future. Um, as First Minister, I cannot instruct courts. Uh, I think every member understands that. Uh, but within the powers we have available to us, and on energy, uh, as the member recognises, these powers are very limited. Of course, this Parliament will and should, uh, and the Government will and should look to see what more we can do to help. But here, as on so many other issues, if we didn't always have to look to the UK Government, and if we held these powers here in Absolutely. the Scottish Parliament, we'd be able to do much more than we are right now. Fiona Hislop. 
We also know from this Parliament's Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee's report into energy price rises that customers moving into properties with expensive prepayment meters also have to pay for the privilege of having them removed. As recommended in last summer's uh, committee report, can the First Minister confirm if her government has raised with the UK government the issue of a legal right under appropriate circumstances to have a prepayment meter removed free of charge? First Minister. Yeah, this is an important issue that, that Fiona Hislop also raises, and I absolutely agree that consumers should be entitled uh, to have a prepayment meter removed from their homes uh, and at no cost to them. Uh, the Energy Secretary wrote to the UK Government last autumn on a number of issues, including protections and flexibility for consumers on prepayment meters. And given recent developments surrounding prepayment meters, I can confirm that this is one of a number of issues that we will be raising urgently with both the UK Government and the regulator. Question number six, Mark Ruskell. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether oil and gas companies are investing enough of their profits to support a just transition in Scotland. First Minister. I certainly think uh, that more could be done. The energy profit levies investment allowance doesn't do enough to future-proof energy supplies and promote green energy. Energy companies should reinvest uh, their profits right now, their very significant profits in industries of the future. The draft energy strategy and just transition plan uh, published last month sets out a clear vision to capitalise on the enormous opportunities that a net zero energy system offers the industry, our economy and our climate. It highlights the importance of accelerating the transition to renewable energy sources. Uh, we've clearly and repeatedly set out the actions that the UK government uh, should and must now take to ensure a fair and just transition for our energy sector and what will be a decisive decade for action. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? Despite the utterly obscene profits of the oil and gas companies, investment in transition is not happening at anything like the pace needed to keep 1.5 alive. Over the last week, I've met with both Shell and ExxonMobil, who operate the Moss Moran complex in Fife, the third largest climate polluter in Scotland. Does the First Minister agree that we cannot meet Scotland's climate targets without slashing Moss Moran's emissions? And will she call on both the operators and the UK Government to commit to investment in a just transition plan for the Moss Moran complex? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, let me reiterate uh, the Scottish Government's commitment to a just transition uh, that both meets our climate targets but also supports <coughs> good green jobs uh, for our highly skilled workforce um, and that allows industry to retain international competitiveness. Uh, Mark Ruskell is right to say that the decarbonisation of industry plays a vitally important role in achieving all of that and operators, including those at Moss Moran, uh, have much to gain from being at the forefront of a just transition uh, and I would urge them to make sure that is exactly uh, where they are. Uh, we're currently developing a just transition plan uh, for Scotland's largest industrial site at Grangemouth uh, and on completion of that we will evaluate and consider what learnings can be replicated across other sites uh, like Moss Moran. Uh, the draft energy strategy and just transition plan it makes clear of course that the UK government must also take action across a number of areas and we continue to urge them to commit to a concrete uh, timeline and processes uh, to ensure that that is the case. We move to general and constituency supplementaries. I call Jackie Bailey. The First Minister has been sent a letter from the STUC and Commonweal setting out their serious concerns about the National Care Service Bill, uh, asking that the bill is paused. They're joined by the GMB, Unison, Unite, the Scottish Pensioners Forum, Who Cares Scotland, Parkinson's UK, respected Professor of Public Policy, James Mitchell, the SNP trade union group and more besides. And this follows significant criticism of the bill by no less than four committees of this parliament, COSLA, a host of care providers and those receiving care themselves. There's nothing to stop the SNP from delivering improvements to social care now, like fair pay and ending non-residential care charges. But the sector is concerned that the SNP are not listening to their concerns and are intent on bulldozing this bill through. Will the First Minister pause the bill and take the time required to get it right? First Minister. Of course we will uh, take the, the time required to get it uh, right. Uh, there was a line in the letter that Jackie Bailey referred to that she didn't read out, of course, so I will. We want to emphasise that we share the Scottish Government's desire to create a national care service. There are several committees of this Parliament scrutinising the bill at stage one. 
Uh, when we uh, have all of the reports and all of the feedback, uh, we will take time to consider uh, all of the issues that have been raised. And of course, at that stage, we will set out uh, the time scale uh, for the rest of the legislative uh, process. And of course, in the interim, uh, we are taking steps to improve uh, social care. Yep. Uh, and let's remember what a national care service is about. It's about ending the postcode lottery in care provision, and it's about better rewarding those who work within the sector. In the year ahead, we're taking action to boost social care workers' uh, pay and, of course, getting the initial organisational arrangements in place. So we'll continue to proceed in that responsible way. Uh, and as we do so, we will listen to the views of all of the organisations uh, that are signatories to the letter, um, and I'm sure many others beside. Julian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister, along with the Minister for Public Health, convened a further summit on abortion services earlier this week, which was hugely useful in exploring further themes for my Members' Bill, and I'm very grateful for the Scottish Government's support. Could the First Minister update the Chamber on next steps and what she sees as the most important steps we can take to protect and further abortion rights in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I was uh, very pleased to convene with Marie Todd uh, the, the second uh, abortion summit uh, on Tuesday and thank uh, those members from across the parties here who attended uh, that. We had a very constructive discussion on the outcomes of the recent UK Supreme Court judgment on Northern Ireland's Safe Access Zones Bill and on the further issues we must consider for Scottish legislation. Uh, the discussion underlined the continuing need uh, for national legislation on this matter and let me reiterate the government's commitment to that uh, and of course provided useful insights as the government continues to work with Gillian Mackay to develop a bill that is robust and effective uh, and I know we want to see that introduced to the Scottish Parliament uh, as soon as possible. In addition, we were all clear uh, that the commitments to progressing abortion care and ensuring that women have access to high quality abortion care in Scotland uh, that are outlined in the Women's Health Plan are a priority and will be taken forward. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Uh, the BBC documentary Beneath the Magic Circle Affair cast light on a very dark and distressing subject. Senior members of Scotland's legal establishment sexually abused children for decades. Susie Henderson's childhood was destroyed at the hands of her untouchable QC father and his vile associates. Yet the government's child abuse inquiry will not hear evidence about this. Uh, other survivors, including young footballers, have called for the inquiry to broaden its scope. So I would like to ask Nicola Sturgeon if that will happen. First Minister. Firstly, the content of the BBC documentary uh, were extreme, was sorry, extremely uh, distressing and disturbing. And um, I think all of us uh, want to ensure um, that these matters in the appropriate way are properly investigated. Obviously, any uh, criminal investigations are for the, the Crown and it would be deeply inappropriate for me or anybody else to comment on that. In terms of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, I absolutely hear uh, the points uh, that the member is making, but as uh, he is aware, under the Inquiries Act, uh, the remit uh, and the conduct of a public inquiry is entirely for the inquiry and for the chair uh, of the inquiry and ministers cannot intervene in that uh, but it is really important uh, that all of the matters raised uh, in whatever uh, way is necessary uh, are properly scrutinized uh, probed and investigated and i think that is something all of us uh, want to ensure is the case paul mclennan Thank you, Presiding Officer. A new report from the National Institute for Economic and Social Research warns that households in my constituency and right across the UK could face a 4,000 financial crisis, uh, hit from the cost of living crisis this year. Can I ask the First Minister what can the Scottish Government do to urge the UK Government to reverse its plans to allow energy bills to rise again this spring, which will only heap more misery on those already suffering? First Minister. Well, Paul McLennan is right uh, to raise the impact on households in his constituency and across Scotland. We've consistently called on the UK Government to provide additional support for vulnerable households with their energy costs. Uh, prior to the introduction of the energy price guarantee last October, we called for the energy price cap to be frozen. Uh, and now uh, we need the UK Government to urgently uh, consider cancelling its proposed uh, rise, uh, along with the reduction in support for domestic uh, consumers. Uh, we continue to take action we can to support households, including, uh, as I said earlier on, doubling of the fuel insecurity fund. Uh, but the key levers here uh, do lie with the UK Government and we must press them to use those levers in the interests of households and businesses across the country. Andrew de Grant. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has betrayed communities in the north of Scotland with her broken promise to duel the A9. It is clear that the work required to fulfil this promise has never been done. Her government seek to blame events that should never have impacted on this timetable. So will she now give us a date for completion of the duelling of the A9, or is she really telling us that the Greens are running her government? First Minister. Well, firstly, let me, let me be very clear. The Scottish Government is firmly committed to completing the duelling of the A9 between Perth and Thank you. Inverness. Uh, that's a £3 billion investment. Uh, there's been already over £430 million invested in it. Road users are already benefiting from some stretches already duelled. Um, on the uh, issue covered in Parliament uh, yesterday, uh, we have carefully reviewed uh, the submitted tender for that stretch and concluded, uh, after a very difficult and complex procurement procedure, the award of that contract at this time would not represent best value for the taxpayer. The price of that tender was significantly higher than expected, even allowing for the impacts of inflation and a volatile economy. And had we gone ahead with that, then down the line, I am sure opposition members would have criticised us for doing so because it wasn't best value for the taxpayer. As the Transport Secretary uh, set out uh, yesterday, uh, steps will now be taken uh, by Transport Scotland on the necessary preparatory steps for the urgent retendering with the aim of achieving a contract award before the end of uh, this year and a new timetable will be set out as quickly as possible. Uh, it is also important to point out, finally, Presiding Officer, that design work is progressing on the rest of the programme with ministerial decisions to complete the statutory process confirmed for seven of the remaining eight schemes. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's debate in the name of Emma Roddick. And there will be a short suspension now to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so. Okay, if I could ask those leaving the public gallery and indeed leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible as we move on to the next item of business, which is a member's business debate on motion 7249 in the name of Emma Roddick on UK income inequality. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put, so I'd invite members who wish to participate to press the request, request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I call on Ms Roddick to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to those who supported my motion to allow it to be debated today and give us the opportunity to discuss this Financial Times analysis because it covers such an important issue and one that is not given enough attention. I think in the, the hustle and bustle of everyday politics and, and the headlines, we often forget to, to step back and look at the big picture. And I hope folk will do that just for a moment, putting aside COVID, Brexit, strikes, to look at the UK as a whole and how it is functioning. We are living in a country whose governments have long made public policy designed to help the rich get richer, to promote endless private economic growth at the expense of looking after its citizens. We are living in an extremely unequal society where the richest can enjoy a good life and the worst off are in dire poverty, more likely to experience serious health issues and require significant support needs. It's perhaps harder to see because those in the public eye, celebrities, high earners, MPs with fortunate backgrounds, can seem to represent the UK in more than just TV interviews, but they do not. 
Financial Times analysis last year described the UK more accurately as a poor society with some very rich people in it. Another accurate description can be found in Dick Gawkins' lyrics, they make the laws to serve them well and feed the rich while poor men starve. That is the hard truth. Half of the people in this country account for 9% of the wealth and Conservative governments do their best to ensure that that gap keeps getting bigger. This is normal to us, but it is not normal. The same Financial Times analysis found that the poorest Irish household has a standard of living almost 63% higher than the poorest in the UK. Other younger nations like Slovenia are also likely to, from next year, have a higher average standard of living than us. And the message I want to get out there is that there are better ways forward than what we are used to. There are alternative economic ideologies to conservatism and we can redistribute wealth so that nobody has to experience extreme poverty. There are, there are examples of alternatives across Europe and there's also a clear one presented in the Scottish Government's Building a New Scotland papers. We could be more like European neighbours such as Sweden, Ireland, Finland, Denmark who use their full powers to achieve a fairer society as well as economic success. Being taken out of Europe against the wishes of the Scottish electorate has led my region of the Highlands and Islands to lose out on funding we previously, previously relied on for projects that improved the economy of rural and island communities as well as the lives of the people living in them. The replacement funding that we've seen so far has fallen far short of what we used to get and far short of what Whitehall promised. There's a big lie that we're taught the huge gap between the richest and poorest in this society is a necessary side effect of having a healthy economy. And firstly, I would argue that's not a worthwhile sacrifice in the first place. But secondly, it is not even true. Conservative capitalist policies have resulted in an unequal society and the UK being the only country in the G7 forecast to have negative growth, worse than Russia, which has been facing international sanctions for almost a year. I've always found that people will try to put those of us who didn't grow up learning about stocks and shares and didn't study PPE at Oxbridge off debating financial policy, using buzzwords and talking about the businesses they run, investment funds, using frames of reference that are so far removed from what most of us will ever experience that it seems like there's no room in the debate for those on the left. But there is. Because even if you believe that a more socialist approach to public spending would crash the economy, I have to ask at this point, what have you got to lose? Because conservative and neoliberal capitalist policies have just crashed the economy. Let's give something else a try. Successive Tory UK governments have historically fixed or more, accurate, more accurately covered up cash flow issues that they like to pretend don't exist under conservatism by selling off public services. But the problem with that is that once you've sold off the Royal Mail, you can't sell it off again. And all it's done is gift future governments the issue of having to deal with private interests running roughshod over workers' rights with ministers no longer able to force changes to paying conditions and having nobody but its own institution to blame. People deserve a government that will do better than that, that will acknowledge issues and tackle them rather than pretend it's not happening. Most people, whether they're personally managing or not, do not want to live in a country where kids grow up hungry and in poverty when there's no need for it. Most want public services to be run in the interests of the public, not private shareholders. Most are happy to pay their share to make sure that they don't live in that kind of country. And that's what we have to remember when we are making decisions here on things like taxes, like the Scottish Government has done this year by asking those on the highest incomes to pay 1p more on their top rate of tax. Taxes are not like giving to charity. Living in a civilised society where opportunity is available to everyone isn't or certainly shouldn't be a charity case. I don't want to go out and ask rich folk to consider giving money to the cause of people not being left destitute because they needed to access what should be a public service free at the point of need. That's why taxes are not optional. They are the price of living in a country that provides you with security and public services. And I'm personally happy to pay a lot more in tax than someone earning what I used to earn three years ago for the sake of the Scottish Government being able to pay money to kids growing up in poverty. The Scottish Government is doing more than any other administration in the UK to help those who need it most and reduce inequality, introducing measures like the Scottish Child Payment, unique in the Four Nations, and working on proposals for a minimum income guarantee. Imagine what more we could do with the powers of independence. Because we have everything it takes to become a successful, fair, internationalist nation, apart from not being tied to a Westminster that brings us Brexit, cost of living crises, and austerity. 
The UK economy is not strong and stable. It hasn't got broad shoulders. It is failing the people of Scotland. The opposition will continue to criticise us for highlighting these facts, but people need to know. People deserve to know why the promises of prosperity and opportunity never appear. And they need to know how much fairer other countries, which are doing what the SNP wants to do, are. If other countries in Europe can tackle inequality through independence in Europe, why not Scotland? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roddick. We now move to the open debate. I first call Edward Mountain to be followed by Kyle Mockin. Around four minutes, Mr. Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank Emma Roddick for bringing this debate. I actually found it quite interesting, a lot of what she was saying. And the cost of living crisis, which she's referred to, is something that we all have to live with. And we should be under no illusions, no one should be any un under any illusions, that this cost of living crisis has been mainly driven by Russia's illegal invasion into Ukraine. It is them that have driven up the prices of electricity. It is them that has driven up the cost of power. It is them that has driven up the cost of fertilizer and the production of all the basic needs in food that we require. I do accept, can I just get a little bit further and then of course I will give way. I accept there is more to do, which is why I believe that driving down inflation to half of where it is, why we need to grow the economy, why we need to reduce the national debt and why we need to build our public services, something we should all be concentrating on. I'd happily give way to the member. Emma Ruddick. I thank the member for giving way and I totally appreciate the point he's making around electricity costing more. But surely it should be the case that if people are having to pay so much for electricity that they have no money left or are being pushed into debt, it is the job of the UK government to step in and use its powers to regulate that market. Edward May. The problem is the UK regulating the UK market doesn't resolve the energy problems and the energy cost. It is a world market which drives it. We can help, and I'll tell you some of the ways that the UK government is helping. I was interested in the article that uh, Emma Roddick uh, quoted, and I think the final paragraph, if I have it here, goes on to say, uh, I can find it, just here I underlined it, our leaders are of course right to target economic growth. That's the, what we should be doing, growing the economy. And we know that by growing the economy we can make everyone uh, better uh, and have a better standard of living. And in my mind, you won't be surprised, no, not just at the moment, but I will in a moment, in my mind, that is not something that comes about with independence where we are building walls which will cut off 60% of our markets. And when we turn, and, uh, as the member has suggested, about building a new Scotland, what I wanted to see in those papers, if they were really going to be anything more than fantasy economics, is discussion about who was paying the pensions, what the currency would be, what the borders barriers would be. We don't have those. In fact, what we do know is that within those papers, we're not even doing some of the things that we've said we were going to do, like uh, benefits payments. We've asked the UK government to continue to do that, because the Scottish Government couldn't. And one of the things that we aren't clear about is the cost of independence. In 2014, that was put down merely as a £200 million. We're probably talking about billions and billions of pounds, because we know that £200 million doesn't go far, doesn't even build two ferries. I'll give way to the member. Jim Thank you, Thank you Edward Mountain, for giving way to that, uh, for that intervention. Um, you mentioned all the things that you think are causing the problems of the UK economy, but Tory Minister, Prime Minister John Major told the Westminster Parliament that the UK's exit from the U EU was a colossal mistake, and yet your party never identify it. Through the chair, Mr it. Fairley. Your, sir, okay. your party never accepts that uh, point. So what would you say about the damage that... Through the chair, Mr Fairley. Through Fairly. the chair, Edward Mount. Uh, presiding officer, uh, through the chair, um, I think that uh, the, the Brexit decision was a decision that was taken in a referendum, and that decision was made as a, a vote, and it was a majority vote, and therefore we should respect the referendum. It's not something I campaigned for, and it's not something that this government really campaigned against. They actually spent more money campaigning in Orkney than they did against Brexit, and that is a fact. 
So let's look at the things, some of the things that we could do better. I think I'm running out of time, presiding officer, as I've taken some interventions. Will you be a little bit... I can, I can give you a bit of time to... Thank you very much, presiding officer. Things that concentrate the minds of people in the Highlands, as far as I can see, is the issues we've discussed this morning, the A9, when it's going to be jewelled. You know, at the rate that they're going, Callum's Road on Rassie was a, was a better investment than the A9. In fact, would have been built quicker because that was just one man who in 10 years built one and a half miles of road. So we're talking about the A96, still not built. The National Treatment Centre, we're all desperate to see 3,200 people in the Highlands alone waiting for treatment, and they're being told that it could be a seven years wait. We're waiting for ferries. They're six years late. We're waiting for HMP Highland. That's six years late. And we're waiting for broadband. Well, we were promised that in 2021. Now, these are the issues that concentrate the minds of the people in the Highland. These are what we should be talking about, not some of the points that Emma Roddick is talking about, which, frankly, is all based around her belief that independence is the only solution. It isn't. There are problems we need to deal with. Let's get on with dealing with them. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Mayton. I now call Carol Mochin to be followed by Paul McLennan. Around four minutes, Ms Mochin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Emma Roddick for bringing the debate to the Chamber. Um, I want to start by welcoming Emma's introduction to her contribution um, and the words that stand out and has motivated me probably my entire life is that we um, live in a poor society with some very rich people and it is ab absolutely shocking the wealth divide across the UK, including in Scotland. Emma Roddick is right to highlight the scale of income inequality in the UK relative to other countries in Europe. And this has undoubtedly, in my view, been exacerbated by the Tory-made cost of living crisis, which has made the poor poorer whilst multi-millionaires record eye-watering profits. And we cannot get away from that. There is eye-watering profits to be made. There is money in the system. We hear about it every day. Um, and it's something that we must challenge. And in my view, wealth can be redistributed. It should be redistributed. And there are acknowledged ways of doing that in a fair and just, and of course now, green way. Of course. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the member for giving way, and I, I agree with her comments up to now. Um, earlier this morning, I attended a Wellbeing uh, Economy Alliance event, uh, and there was discussion about the gap between the richest and the poorest in Scotland, but also the opportunities that Scotland has to nurture purposeful uh, business that makes a positive difference to, among other things, our well-being, rather than just putting profits in the pockets of, of um, shareholders. Would the member agree that that is a good thing for Scotland and we should embrace that? Callum Walken, I can give you the time back. Th thank you, presiding officer. And yes, of course, uh, you may know I, I attended the same meeting, which um, did give us some really excellent food for thought in terms of how we actually move forward with the economy and the way in which we encourage people, communities to be part of what we would describe as business, but community wealth building, letting them be in charge of their areas, people will know I am extremely positive about. And the example they gave in North Ayrshire, Joe Cullinane was the council leader there who took bold steps, in my view, but in his view, he was just being fair uh, about how we run our economies for communities. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, where I think uh, Emma Roddick and I will disagree um, is that to reduce income inequality, in my view, the step of leaving the UK is not the answer. Um, I would suggest that by delivering a Labour government um, at Westminster that would repeal anti-trade union legislation, invest in services and communities and offer fairer jobs to people. I think that would be a better solidarity in terms of looking at how we run the community in the UK. Well-paid jobs where workers, uh, unlike under the current Scottish and UK governments, are treated with the respect I think that they deserve. Indeed, uh, presiding officer, before the cost of living crisis, the cost of living in more rural communities was already substantially higher 
than their urban counterparts. Yet the Scottish gov Government has continued to do little for those communities. And I think it was highlighted yesterday by Emma Roddick and Fergus Ewing um, that the Highlands have been deprived of transport uh, links in terms of connectivity around the A9, something that they were promised. Um, I want to also say that in my, of Mem course, the member is just about to conclude. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies for that. In my view, the Scottish Government has not shown the determination. We've had delays in land reform, poor industrial relations with teachers, lack of movement on regressive taxation such as the council tax. And we know that 20 families um, in Scotland own as much wealth as 30% of the rest of the population and it's unacceptable and I do not believe that the Scottish Government have shown enough will. They have done things around the edges and that's what we talk about in this Parliament but I hope that I can get some solidarity in terms of the work we do need to do to make sure that in the Scottish Parliament we do everything that we can do and I know Emma Roddick and others will know that that is my point here is that in the Scottish Parliament, if we believe that gap is so unjust, we must at this point in time do everything that we can and of course fight to get a better uh, economic structure out there in the wider UK and world. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Mochan. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Maggie Chapman for around four minutes. Ms. McLennan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Emma Roddick for bringing forward this important debate this afternoon? Where would you rather live? A society where the rich are extraordinarily rich and the poor are very poor, or one where the rich are merely very well off, but even those in the lowest incomes also enjoy a decent standard of living. That's the opening line from the Financial Times report entitled Britain and the US, US are poor societies with some very rich people. Research has consistently shown that while most people express a desire for some distance between top and bottom, they would rather live in a considerably more equal society than they do at present. Now, Edward Mountain talked about issues in, in the here and now, and some valid points. He talked about, obviously, the invasion of Ukraine. But this is about structural, long-term decline of the UK financial model. Let's look at the position the UK finds itself. On present trends, as Emma Roddick mentioned this, the average Slovenian household will be better off than its British counterpart by 2024. And the average Polish family will move ahead before the end of the decade. The analysis also found that the poorest Irish household had a, hand, a standard of living almost 63%, 63% higher than the poorest in the UK. In the most developed countries, such as neighbouring northwestern European states, the distribution of income is relatively equal, with the top 10% earning about three times as much as the bottom 10%. But uh, the income distributions in the UK, like the US, is much less equal, with the top 10% earning almost five times those at the bottom. This is about long-term structural decline. This doesn't happen overnight. It's policy choices by the UK government. The cost of the union that fails Scotland. Now, on Wednesday, we heard Scottish Tories criticise the Scottish government on Social Security. Whilst the Scottish government were introducing the ground bacon Scottish child payment, the Tories were cutting universal credit. Not one Scottish Tory MSP spoke up against that. Not one. They all sat in silence. So what about our European neighbours? Let's... Yeah, of course. Callum Thank you, President Officer. Um, again, 